Ian Cousin is assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University, where he and his colleagues strive to understand how various systems of organisms, ant swarms, fish schools, bird flocks, form large-scale patterns. He received his undergraduate degree from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland and his PhD in collective animal behavior from the University of Bath. Before joining Princeton, he was a research fellow in both the Department of Zoology and the Center for Mathematical Biology at the University of Oxford. His research and his ideas are generating a lot of excitement in both academia and with the general public, as evidenced by his growing list of distinctions and honors. He is currently a Big Think Delphi Fellow, and two years ago, he was named one of Popular Science Magazine's Brilliant Ten. His research is also finding applications in the business world. He's been an advisor to the Harvard Business Review and the World Economic Forum. I could go on, but more importantly, we would like to hear tonight Professor Ian Cousin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and I'd like to tell you about uh, animal groups today. And so I've always been fascinated by these types of aggregations. And you know, I saw these when I was a kid on television, fish schools, and shortly you'll see bird flocks forming these highly coordinated groups. And what's remarkable is that we still only have a very rudimentary understanding of both how and why animals form these types of aggregates. These are actually unrelated or largely unrelated individuals. And so there's a real evolutionary question as to why this happens, as well as the mechanistic angle. And so I, I stole this photograph from Qantas in Flight magazine on one of those lovely 22-hour trips to Australia. And I, I always regret not having taken the, the photographer's name because I, I love this photo. These are sheep, and they're crossing a bridge here. But you can almost imagine this almost like cells, like a bacteria swarm, uh, because we're so high up. And I've added these yellow arrows here to show you this little vortex of sheep. And this is indicative to us that the interactions among these individuals are relatively local compared to the structure you see there of the group as a whole. You can also see some other features. The sheep will tend to align their direction of travel with near neighbors. They will tend to be attracted towards each other, and that's what gives the group its characteristic shape. Here, where they're crossing the bridge, it's physically the, the structure of their bodies and frictional forces that cause pattern-forming processes. And the last really important thing to notice is we get a sense, and I don't know if this is true, but we get a sense that they sort of seem to be wanting to go in this direction. That is, individuals have memory. They may want to go in certain directions, but they have to reconcile that with these local tendencies. And so these are some very important features, as we'll see in trying to understand how animal groups coordinate their behavior. In my lab, we look at collective behavior across a whole range of scales, because we want to understand what are the fundamental principles. So we, under, we, we study, for example, the cells that heal wounds, that have to collectively migrate before bacterial infection <laughs> sets in. We also study this organism here. It's the most complex organism we study. And I'm not going to have time to talk about this today, but we've been doing manipulative experiments within train stations and, and streets where we have actors within crowds actually subtly manipulating people's behavior so we can look at collective behavior of humans. <laughs> we, we, well, you may, you may think of yourself as very complicated and very sophisticated, but it's kind of remarkable what we can get crowds to actually do. But, I don't have time to talk about all of these things today. So I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing on information transfer in groups. And really notably, what I want to try to hypothesize are new mechanisms for why natural selection would select for group living among unrelated individuals that you won't find in, in traditional textbooks. Then I want to talk about collective decision making and finally about swarming locusts. 
So, again, I, I, I do a lot of work with the BBC, which is uh, always a pleasure, but it also enables me to use very nice graphics because they take my rather shoddy simulations, which I'll show you later, and they put this beautiful graphics on it. So this is actually the simulation I'm going to show you shortly. But what it points out is, you know, as a biologist trying to get inside the head of this individual, <laughs> it's very difficult because we can't use verbal argument alone to think, well, what if they interacted like this? How would that scale up to collective behavior? So just as we can't really understand how neurons in a brain scale up to cognition, similarly, we have the same problem with animal groups. And so the starting point, so this is back in my PhD days, the starting point then was, well, we don't have any data. And I'm not exaggerating. There was no data available for how animal groups formed back in 2002. And so I developed some computational models, and I'm showing you pictures of fish here, but you can think much more broadly of cells or, or birds and, and whatnot. And so one of the things I wanted to represent was that individuals have certain positions. That's the C, which is the center of individual I at time T, and it has a velocity, V. But it also interacts with other individuals. And here I've only shown you one, but of course it can interact with a large number of different individuals. So using uh, computer simulations, we can begin to hypothesize how do the types of interactions that we speculate occur within groups, how do they scale to collective properties? So you don't have to worry about this equation here, but what this equation does is it simulates the fact that you want to maintain personal space. If other people come too close to you in a crowd, you will try to move away to maintain that minimum personal space. You've probably seen birds sitting on a wire, also maintaining minimum space. This is something very common in nature. So that's the top priority, is to avoid collisions with others within the group. But as I showed you with the sheep, there's this tendency to potentially align your direction of travel, align the velocity vectors, and also to attract yourself towards the center of other individuals, so to be attracted towards other individuals. So very, very simple mathematical rules allow us to capture what we think are the basic behavioral tendencies of individuals. And in this particular model, as I showed you before with the nice BBC graphics, it's a three-dimensional model. So individuals are moving through three-dimensional space, this arrow representing their direction of travel, the ZOR of the zone of repulsion, this tendency to want to avoid colliding with others. But if you get isolated from groups, as you'll see later, it's dangerous. And so there's a tendency to become attracted to others if you get too far away. You'll pull back in. And at intermediate distances, you may tend to align your direction of travel with your near neighbors. And so the first thing I found out was that this tendency to align is very, very important in terms of uh, the, the group dynamics that ensue. For example, if you don't have alignment, if you just have the zone of repulsion and the zone of attraction, what we get here, we have a static image from a mobile simulation. It's like a mosquito swarm. So if you just have longer range attraction and local alignment, you get this sort of quasi-stable sort of swarm-type dynamic. But if we introduce a tendency to align your direction of travel with near neighbors, to move in the same direction as near neighbors, then we get a sudden transition in behavior. And suddenly, the group forms what we call a torus, where they rotate uh, perpetually in this formation. Now, what's important to note is I didn't put that into the model. There's nothing in the model that says go in a circle. This is a so-called emergent outcome of those equations of interaction. And the model also predicts that there's a sudden transition between those states. There's nothing in between, nothing stable in between. But similarly, for exactly the same parameters, we also find another type of behavior which we're more familiar with, which is this kind of fluid-like motion that we see within animal groups, such as fish schools and bird flocks. And as I said, this was during my PhD. I'd never had any formal mathematical or computer training, and so I taught myself programming. So I assumed that this was you know, the first code I'd ever written. There must be a bug that caused them to go in the circle. And so I searched for several weeks trying to find it, and I couldn't find it. And this is just a, a screenshot from my screen. You can see it's not, not BBC standards. But I find in the literature, you got frequent examples of this type of torus formation. And so the model makes a fundamental prediction that these are the three states of matter, so to speak, of animal groups if they're following these types of rules. So just like you know, there's a sol there are different types of solids and the molecular compositions differ to each other, 
There are only certain types of matter in nature. So this makes our job a little bit easier, that there's not an infinite number of different behaviors that can be exhibited in these types of animal groups. The other thing the model predicted, and I'm sorry, one of the, one of the lines here is washed out. There's actually a gray line here, which is the degree to which the group is rotating. And you can see it suddenly transitions just by noise, just by what we call stochastic effects, just uh, accumulation of errors. And suddenly the group exhibits a different behavior and then spontaneously switches back. So we predict also that the groups will dynamically switch between these behaviors, even though the individuals are performing exactly the same interaction rules. Just individuals aren't perfectly aligning with each other. They're not perfectly being attracted to each other. You know, the nervous system has error. And so when I came to Princeton in 2008, well, I wanted to start testing these ideas. We still didn't have any data to test this. And this is literally day one. We got these fish, they're called golden shiners. They're bred, you know, a thousand fish cost us 70 bucks because they're bred for the live bait industry. And so we bought these fish, we put them in the tank, and you know, we were really uh, very happy to see that they exhibited exactly the behaviors that we predicted they should exhibit. And we've developed tracking software that can track the motion of the individuals and even deal with the fact that when they overlap with each other, they're very near identical individuals, but we don't lose them. And I should say that this is Hai Shen Wu, a graduate student who's working with us, who's developed this really remarkable software. And this allows us, so this is a sort of close-up view of a much larger experiment. And we can actually track hundreds, there's 800 individuals in this experiment, and this isn't even the entire arena that I'm showing you. And we can get the, 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 the centroid, the center of mass of the individual, the head position, the velocity the individuals are going. So now we have the same level of detail that previously we only had for simulations. We can now get it in reality. And we filmed the fish. This is uh, a period of only 15 minutes, but we filmed these fish for 16 hours, different group sizes. And the only patterns we ever have seen are the three patterns that we predicted would occur within these groups. And as you can see, the groups will also spontaneously switch between the, the polarized state, this aligned state, and this rotating state, as predicted by the model. But we've also been able to go beyond that. And actually, instead of building models to try to ask, you know, uh, do we have the right rules? I mean, you could validly ask me, well, someone else could come up with a different model that may predict the same collective behaviors. How do you know that your model is actually right? And this is a really uh, challenging question. And only recently have we actually been able to develop the tools that allow us to take movement data of fish or of cells or of people and actually mathematically back out what were the rules that created those patterns of motion. And what we find, and I'm not going to go into the details of this, this is just a, a pretty picture from that paper, but I'll just summarize what we found. This is not a simulation. This is actually the forces that an individual feels by the positions of others. And we find that our models actually work fairly well. They, we were on the right lines. There's one big difference. Individuals don't actually know the alignment of others. They only interact with each other as points, really, attraction and repulsion. And the alignment emerges from those interactions. But generally speaking, our models were doing a fairly good job. But individuals don't just live within those, uh, those fish tanks with no environmental conditions. We're also very interested in what are the selection pressures that drive individuals to group under conditions of, of complex environments. So this is simulating uh, an odor plume, for example, or a, a plume of insects within the environment. And we're simulating how individuals, by communicating with each other, can actually maximize their foraging success. And what we've found is that a very simple rule set can provably, and this is an important factor, we can prove that they will be able to solve problems as a group that they cannot solve on their own. If they follow a very simple rule set, if the environment is improving, so if you're detecting this odor plume within the ocean, and your chemical sensors are firing like crazy because the environment's getting better, or you're detecting a good odor plume, then you don't interact with others. However, if your own personal information is weak, or poor, or not informative, then you discount it, and you interact with others. And we find a theorem that can actually show that this is provably 
uh, a, 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 a way to find very complex targets in structured landscapes. And so we wanted to test this idea because this idea is suggesting that this is something individuals cannot do. But by grouping together, they suddenly have an awareness of the environment that they didn't have before. And in actual fact, in computer science, this is an old paper from the early 80s, which has been cited over 15,000 times. In computer science, it had actually been speculated that one could develop algorithms, like little computer programs that interact with each other to search complex data sets. Um, and they deliberately, I mean, they talk here about bird flocking, fish schooling, and swarming. So this idea had actually popped up in the computer science literature. But look what they hypothesize. Each individual remembers the best location that they were at in the environment. Okay, that is maybe not very plausible for animals. Even less plausible is somehow, through some telepathy or whatever, each individual knows the best location everyone else has found and exactly where those locations are. Completely biologically implausible. And yet these algorithms, you know, there's a sort of exponential increase of using these algorithms to, to search through complex space to find, in this case, a solution. This is the globally optimal solution, but you may have got trapped in these suboptimal solutions. And so there's an idea that comes from computer science that grouping can allow you to perform computation. But no one has ever tested this idea. To my knowledge, it's never been tested. And so we set out to do that, and this is unpublished work. But we wanted to ask, well, our fish, the nice thing about them, one of the nice things about them, is they like to be in dark areas. We don't have to train them to do that. They're just scared of light areas because predators can see them against the background. And so what we can do is we can project down a complex environmental structure, and then we can film them with infrared light so we can actually see where the animals are and ask, is there a benefit to being in groups in terms of sensing these complex environments? And so this is a picture. This is using normal light. This is actually what the experiment looks like from above. Here's a fish school you might see in the corner. And what we have is a light gradient, which is quite complex. And as you'll see when I play this movie, it moves around. But we can't track the fish against that background. So we simultaneously film the same scene, the same experiment, in infrared light to allow us to actually really detect where the fish are. And so I'll show you the stages. So this is the real experiment going on up here. And we're tracking the individuals in infrared. We extract them from the background. But because we know what the model is that we're using to project, we can then put the real fish over this projected image so we can work out what is your local environment like. How well can you actually climb these gradients by moving around as a group? And what we find, I think for the first time, is that indeed increasing group size allows the individuals to be able to detect and to respond to these complex environmental conditions. And this could be a very important selection pressure favoring the evolution of grouping among individuals who are of low relatedness. Of course, this could also favor uh, individuals who are closely related. But one thing we discovered here, which we did not expect, is that we find no evidence that the individual fish can even detect or respond to the gradient. So here we have an example where the individuals are fundamentally not capable of solving this problem at all. Yet, as a group, they can solve it. And the algorithm they use, or the, the rules they use, are remarkably simple. They just modify their speed as a function of how dark or how light the environment is. When it's dark and they like it, they move slowly. When it's light and they don't like it, they move fast. That's all they do. They take what we call a scalar measurement, just a measurement of where they are, how light it is, and adjust their speed. And the group, as it moves through space, the individuals that find the dark region slow down, the individuals in the light region move fast, and they kind of swing around, collectively sampling the environment. So here we have an example, really, where grouping facilitates an awareness of the environment that individuals do not have. And this gives us actually a new idea of how cells can actually navigate through environments. 
So just by taking scalar measurements of chemicals, just measurements of you know, that particular part of the cell, and then changing the microtubule machinery, you could actually collectively allow cells to, to, to climb gradients using a similar uh, way. And so just to be absolutely sure that we've got things right, we then create a simulation model, very much like the one I showed you before, but a bit simpler and in two dimensions, where we have only social interactions and this light-dependent speed. There's no capacity for these individuals to detect or to move up the light gradient at all. And yet, in the simulation, collectively, they can have an awareness of the environment that individuals do not have. So it's a true emergence of a feature by aggregating together that the individuals cannot achieve when they're on their own. The species we work on, these golden shiners, another really nice thing about them is they're, they're almost exclusively visual. They don't use the lateral line, which is a pressure sensing mechanism within fish. And so what we can do is in our software, we can calculate the positions of their eyes and using a technique called ray casting, where we cast out hundreds of thousands of lines and see where do they intersect with others, we can reconstruct what each one sees as it's making decisions. So just to zoom in here, you can see us tracking the positions of the eyes. This is just one frame. We do this 60 times per second in real time using uh, graphics cards, video game cards to perform these computations. And then we can create networks of interactions that are actually based on the sensors that the individuals are actually using to coordinate their behavior. So we don't have to speculate to such a great degree about what's going on. And we can test hypotheses as to how groups are so robust to perturbations and yet so sensitive to information, which is a key question in understanding collective dynamics of any system. This is a fast-forwarded movie of a 1,000 fish. We had to clean our tanks out, so we chucked in all the fish into the big arena, and suddenly we saw these types of patterns, these waves crossing the group. So you can see individuals, by moving, they're exciting each other. The group is capable of processing information. And one of the things you know, that's really remarkable when you watch these types of uh, programs is how you can see you know, in the 1940s and 1950s, people thought there had to be telepathy to allow groups to have these highly coordinated behaviors. This is the same model I showed you before, but I've added one more rule, which is if you see the predator, you, you move away from it, which is a biologically plausible rule. And again, I worked with the BBC here, and I, I thank them for cutting this in with some very nice footage. I developed this just before The Matrix came out. And I was, <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you how gutted I was when I actually saw them doing that with real people. I thought I was, you know, uh, anyway. It's still, it's, it's still kind of cool. And I want to leave it to the penguins, because that's my favorite bit. Just look at that. Just beautiful. Um, and I don't have time to talk about this stuff today, but we've developed a robo-predator. So this is a robot that's controlled uh, through Bluetooth. There's a, an autonomous robot underneath the tank with a magnetic connection. And this allows us to create these types of, of perturbations within groups. We've also been working with a brand new type of acoustic imaging called Didson, or acoustic video, that allows us to track predators and also prey interactions for effectively unlimited periods of time in natural environments. So we can really test our ideas within natural conditions also. And so the idea, one of the, the concepts here, is can we really think of animal groups as exhibiting some sort of collective mind? Can we think of collective cognition within these groups? Bear in mind that these are unrelated individuals. Okay? So there's some challenges to explaining this type of behavior. And so I want to talk about some earlier work and then move on to some very, very recent stuff that looks at leadership and consensus decision making within these types of groups. So again, I'm showing you pictures of fish. But you can think of zebra or ungulates or whatever. These, we deliberately make these models as simple as possible so they can be as generalizable as possible. We're not trying to capture the, the absolute details of any one system. We're trying to capture something about the general nature of swarming systems or grouping systems. So in this case, a bit like the sheep I showed you before, this individual here has an idea about where to go. It may want to move in that direction because it wants to migrate that way, or perhaps it remembers there's food over there and the others don't know. Perhaps I'm a predator and it sees me and the others don't, and it wants to move away. We're not defining 
what the information is, but this individual has information and the other individuals don't. Does it have to signal that it has information? Do others have to recognize who has information and who does not for it to be propagated within groups? So again, using computational models gives us a powerful tool for asking these types of questions. How much complexity is needed to allow information to transfer in groups? So again, a very simple model in two dimensions, now just with two zones, zone of repulsion, and in this zone you're attracted and you tend to align with neighbors. And as I explained to you before, this will tend to create these kind of social forces, these social tendencies, sort of schooling behaviors. But of course, this individual may have goal-oriented behaviors, in this case, to move in this direction. Now, what's very important is that I've colored this individual bright red so we can see who has information. In the model, they start at random positions, random orientations, and there's no way of inferring who does and who does not have information. There's no cheating going on. So when I show you colors, it's simply so we can see the informational status of individuals. But they don't communicate that explicitly to each other. But individuals with information, with this goal-oriented tendency, have to reconcile it with their social tendency. And we assume they do so with a term that we call omega, this W shape here. So omega is how strongly you want to move in this goal-oriented direction. If omega is very small, you don't really care, you're not very hungry, you really want to stick with the group, so the social tendency dominates. If omega becomes very large, then this tendency is very, very strong and can actually outweigh that tendency. And, and in fact, you can leave the group completely if it's strong enough or too strong. Okay, so firstly, we want to ask, well, in the absence of explicit communication, can groups be guided by individuals with information? So here, an individual colored white wants to guide the group along the x-axis. And it's a group of 100. I'm showing you every 10th frame of the simulation but it's not able to guide the group. But if I put in five informed individuals within the group, then you can see after a period of reorganization, they kind of go in the right direction. You can certainly see that some information has been transmitted, albeit not incredibly accurately. However, with 10 informed individuals, suddenly and spontaneously, the group goes in that direction. And we can quantify that. We can measure this ability to guide the group. How well was information transmitted from zero, being it was terrible, the group just went randomly, to one, it went perfectly in the right direction, which it never does because there's randomness in these models. But you can see for all of these group sizes, as I increase the proportion of informed individuals, the accuracy of the group increases and then begins to flatten out. But if you look at this group here, this is a group of 10. For it to be around 85% accurate, well, I need around half of the individuals to have information. But look what happens when I go to a group of 200, shown in red. If I want to be the same level of accuracy, around 85% accuracy, now I need only around 5% of the individuals to have information. So as groups get larger, the proportion of informed individuals you need to guide for a given level of accuracy gets much, much smaller. And since this work, we've simulated tens of thousands of individuals, and this number becomes infinitesimal. And so when you're seeing animals moving across a landscape, it need not be that everybody has information. You only need a very small proportion, especially for large groups. But so far, my informed individuals have all been in agreement. They've all wanted to go along that x-axis together. Well, in many groups, including human societies, there can be disagreements about where to go. So can these groups resolve disagreements and come to collective consensus decisions? Now, if we were to come to a consensus, say we wanted to all go to the same pub after this talk, which I think is an excellent idea, <laughs> and, and six of you had a preference for one pub, and five of you had a preference for another, and the rest of you didn't know this region of Boston very well and had no preference, how would we solve that? I would perhaps ask you the question, you'd put your hands up, I'd do a calculation, and I'd pass you back the answer. That's hierarchical control. We're very familiar with that. But these individuals do not have that cognitive capability. So can they perform this without needing that type of ability? So this represents the case where some individuals want to go one way, 
Other individuals want to go somewhere else, and other individuals yet don't know what's going on. Sort of uninformed individuals. Well, I'm going to set it up in the following way. One of my groups, this dotted line here, is always want to, going to want to go zero degrees, which you can imagine to be along the x-axis. Okay, so they always want to go that way. And so I'm going to change the degree to which the other group disagrees with them. Okay, here they're completely in agreement, but I can increase, this is the degree to which they disagree, this all the way up to 180 degrees, where they actually want to go in opposite directions. And so for every single degree of difference of opinion, I run thousands of simulations and ask, where does the group go? And I have a group of 100, just sort of arbitrarily, and five want to go one way, and five want to go the other way. And this is just showing you where the group tends to go in those thousands of simulations. And what you note is that below a critical difference of opinion of around 135 degrees, they split the difference, and they, they go the average between the two chosen options. But above that, there's what we call a bifurcation, a sudden change in collective behavior, where suddenly now, half of the time, this is not the group splitting. This is half of the time this group wins, and they all go this way. And half of the time this group wins, and they all go that way. So we've gone from averaging information to consensus decision making very, very suddenly. Now, if I just add one more individual to one of those subsets, 1% of total group size. Again, they can't talk to each other. They start at random positions and random orientations. So now I have six that want to go along my x-axis and five that disagree with them. Before it was five and five. Something dramatic changes. And now, they effectively are counting. They're not counting. They don't have the capacity to count. But effectively, they're voting. And they're choosing the majority preferred direction, even with that tiny little difference um, in terms of the group dynamics. And I won't go into details of the experiments, but since this work was published, there's been a whole bunch of experiments that have tested this and, and shown that this is, really seems to be happening within animal groups. I will come to experimental tests of a more modern uh, derivation of this theory in a moment. But the perceptive among you might be thinking, well, 135 degrees, that's a pretty big difference of opinion. You know, if you want to go that way, and I want to go this way, and we both end up going that way, we could both end up in the jaws of some predator. So in the actual paper, we also look at various different types of learning and forgetting rules that allow us to, to move this around. But I don't want to talk about that today, because there's actually something very interesting that happens even in the simplest possible model. Because as you're moving towards two different targets in space, say the red ones want to get to the red target and the white ones to the white target, well, this angle here, that's below 135 degrees. But as they approach the target, you're always going to reach the critical bifurcation point. So regardless of how you set up the model, the groups are always capable of coming to consensus decisions. So there's an equal number wanting to get to the white and the red target. And in this case, they chose the red one. But it's 50-50. And I've just added one more white individual to the group. And I hope you sort of see the local noisy nature of the interactions. And yet, 99% of the time, they will effectively vote and choose the majority target, even though they're not counting, as I mentioned before. But what if individuals are really unwilling to give up on their opinions? What if your omega is really large? Well, in these conditions, the groups will tend to split apart. And there's actually a very interesting intermediate region of parameter space, intermediate omegas, where the groups will actually check out the different options before <laughs> making a decision. So again, you know, as biologists, when you see this kind of behavior at the group level, you think, wow, that's really cognitively complex. Well, it need not be so. This is, by the way, for, for biologists in the audience, it's called trap lining behavior. OK, so then I got really interested in this idea about, well, what about the strength of your opinion? OK, I've shown you that if there's a greater number that want to do one thing versus something else, that the, the, the majority will tend to win. But what about just becoming really intransigent and unwilling to give up on your opinions? And so we're familiar with democratic consensus. And uh, voting systems and committees have emerged all over the world in, in, in a vast number of different cultures. And so you can ask yourself, why does that emerge in human societies? Well, there are often conflicting interests among group members when making collective decisions. And yet, failing to come to a consensus can be costly. Anyone that's been on, a, say, a faculty committee that's deciding on a new member of your department is aware of this. The cost of not choosing anybody is great. But it doesn't mean that everybody agrees 
with the people, with the candidates. Okay? So you come with what we call an adversarial democracy. I mean, I'm sure this room has a, a variety of different opinions uh, regarding who should be in the White House. And yet the country as a whole has come to a democratic consensus. So we're very familiar with this. And we're also familiar with conceptually the idea that individuals may be susceptible to manipulation by extremists, by very strongly opinionated minorities within groups. And you know, this has been argued for both humans and animals that uninformed individuals within groups or individuals without strong preferences may actually be manipulated by these sort of extremist factions, by individuals that have strong opinions. Yet I cannot find any quantitative or rigorous scientific evidence for this statement. I'd be very, very interested if anyone has some. I've asked this every talk I've given for the last sort of three or four months, and no one has been able to find actual evidence uh, regarding this statement. I'd be, I'd be very interested. So in human society, what do we do? Well, we have voting. Voting promotes fair representation. Okay, so it doesn't matter how strong my view is. I just get one vote. Actually, I don't get any votes because I don't have a correct visa. But if I were to be able to vote, I would still have one vote. Okay, and that's in the U.S. Constitution even. You know, that voting actually inhibits you know, extremely opinionated people from being disproportionately influential. Okay, so it's a fair representation of views. The decisions are based on the number of votes as opposed to the strength of opinion of individuals. But in animal groups, they have a very limited means of conveying votes, no global overview, and only relatively local interaction. So does this concept of democratic decision-making even make any sense? So we can consider the same type of model where individuals have different preferences. And as I mentioned before, if there's a majority wants to go one way versus a minority, the majority will tend to win. But what if the minority just increases the strength of their opinion, increases the strength of their omega? They become intransigent to change. They really don't want to change their opinion. Can that work? Well, it turns out it works extremely well if everybody in the group has opinions. So here we have a majority versus a minority, and if they have the same opinion strength, as I said, the majority will tend to win, close to 100% of the time. But as the minority increases the strength of their opinion, the strength of their omega, eventually they can actually control the group behavior. So this leads to attention. There's a sort of arms race just to become more and more strongly opinionated because it can work. But this is in the case where everybody has a preference or an opinion. What about if there are uninformed individuals or those with weak preferences within the group? Well, then everything changes. So now the minority has a stronger preference than the majority, but not so strong. In fact, the majority still wins 60% of the time. But look what happens when I start adding in some stupid individuals, or individuals that, that don't have preferences. It flips control back to the majority more strongly before eventually it saturates, and that's due to the local interactions in this particular model. What if I increase the minority preference further? Now the minority wins almost 90% of the time, if everybody has a preference. But adding in uninformed individuals, or those without strong preferences, flips control back to the majority. And this occurs right across parameter space. And it doesn't matter about the exact numbers that I chose. But yet, this is just a simulation model of animal groups. So you may ask yourself, well, that's interesting, but does that actually extend to other types of systems, uh, perhaps in, in biology? And so we wanted to ask the question, is this a perhaps, we don't know, this is brand new, this work was published in December. Um, is this perhaps a general principle? So we can simulate individuals interacting on networks, for example, uh, and, you know, one common property of many biological systems are that individuals can influence and be influenced by others with whom they interact. Uh, and this is where I got carried away with my, my new keynote. I put some flames in here. But, so whether we're dealing with agent systems, neural systems, or perhaps human systems, they have this characteristic feature. Now, we're not studying any of these systems. We're just de deliberately looking at very abstracted versions of reality. And we looked at two models one is called an adaptive network model, and one is called a convention model of opinion dynamics. And I don't have time to talk about this, but I want to highlight that these are simplified models that give us general principles of how collective decisions are made in other types of systems. So I'll describe to you the results of the adaptive network model. So in this model, individuals are represented as nodes on a network with edges between them, lines between them representing interactions. So it's as if I interact with you, 
You may have a different opinion to me on a certain topic, but I may then interact with you. You may also have a different opinion, or you may have the same opinion. But I may change your opinion. Vice versa, you may change my opinion. So the one rule that we assume is that if I interact with you, you have a sudden small probability of changing my opinion, if you differ in it. And I have a sudden small probability of changing my opinion to yours. But if I interact with two people, and you both differ in opinion to me, I have more than twice that probability of changing. That's the one mathematical thing you need. The rest is very, very general. And we can show this works mathematically, as I'll show you shortly. So here we just look at two opinions, you know, left or right, red or green. A strongly opinionated minority and a less strongly opinionated majority and individuals that begin with no preference or don't have strong preferences regarding the outcome. Okay, and informed individuals exhibit intransigence. In this particular model, it's as if I manage to change your opinion, and then I wander off and chat to other people. You go, well, maybe he's full of, full of nonsense, and you change back. Okay, so it's like a, a propensity to return to your opinion. But you could also have a, as a, an inability or a, a lack of ability to leave your opinion. And what we find within this model is just what we find within the, the model of swarms, that if the minority is controlling group dynamics by having a strong opinion, and then we add uninformed individuals, individuals with like strong preferences, to our network. Nothing changes, nothing changes, nothing changes. We keep adding uninformed individuals, and suddenly just adding a few more individuals completely changes the outcome of the decision, and now the majority tends to win. So it's really kind of remarkable how adding a few individuals that don't even have preferences can completely change the outcome of population-level decisions. And we can then generate a system of equations, and I won't go into details as to how we did this, but what the nice thing about this is we can go beyond just simulating. We can actually use mathematics to show that this red line here, there's only a way for the minority to win below a critical density of uninformed. There's nothing you can do about that. It's related to the dynamics of this network. And so we can show that there's only one stable minority state if there's not enough uninformed individuals. But then suddenly, there's an appearance of what's called a saddle node bifurcation. And then there are two states, the majority state and the minority state. And as I showed you before, they hop over to the majority state. And so this just allows us, the nice thing about this, it allows us to ask questions about, OK, so if we have no uninformed individuals, the key parameters here are the relative strength of the minority preference. As the minority preference gets stronger, the minority is more likely to win. But the majority can compensate by increasing their numerical majority. And so the majority tends to win in this gray region, and the minority wins within this black region. But this, again, was with no uninformed individuals. If we add enough uninformed individuals, then this is the region, this huge region here, is the region where, where the minority used to win. Now they can no longer win. It's converted to majority control by those uninformed individuals. And so the minority, so the, the, the strategy of just increasing your opinion, just becoming more opinionated, just does not work when you have uh, individuals with, with low preferences within these groups. So I do want to say that I'm not saying anything regarding the quality of these opinions. I'm not saying this is a good thing or a bad thing. You know, this minority could be you know, the next Steve Jobs or whatever. I'm not saying that this is good. This is just regarding the dynamics of the system. And because we find this in many different models, we've now looked at the Voter model, the Ising model, and many different models, there seems to be some underlying mathematical characteristics that, that explains this type of phenomenon. So the message, really, is that we have a theoretically testable prediction. You know, I'm a biologist. I want to test this idea. And it's that uninformed individuals should inhibit the influence of a strongly opinionated minority and return control to the majority. And so within the lab, you know, where you're working with these fish, this is kind of the regional parameter space we can work with. Zero, five, or 10 uninformed individuals. But you can see that we predict them to have a very strong influence on decision making. And so what we do is fish are very clever little creatures. We can train them to have preferences for two different colored targets. So some want to reach the yellow target. They're trained with the reward to the yellow. Some want to reach the blue target. And we can just let them go and ask, where do you go? And so we've done a whole bunch of experiments. And we looked at this case of six versus five. The target the minority are trained to is inherently biased. They have a stronger preference. If anyone's interested in how we do that, I can discuss it later. 
Uninformed individuals don't have a bias, and we predict that we should have a strong result even with 0, 5, and 10 naive individuals. And so this is the theory, and without any uh, uninformed individuals, we set it up so the minority was strongly opinionated. So they tend to win out. But then if we add in five individuals that don't really have a preference, or ten, you can see, as predicted by our theory, we've flipped control from minority control back to majority control just by adding individuals that don't have preferences or are uninformed. They're not even aware a decision is being made in this case. And so the message here is that uninformed individuals inhibit extremist views and promote democratic consensus decision-making within <laughs> groups. And so the last part of the talk, I want to talk about another sort of dramatic example of collective behavior, which is insect mass migration. And I want to ask some really basic biological questions. When, where, and why do insects exhibit collective migration? And what are the biological processes that underlie it? And so you might be amazed, but you know, we really don't have, or we didn't have a good idea as to how and why locusts swarmed. And this is what I really wanted to work on, because these are incredibly important pest insects, as I'll show you shortly. But by the time the swarms take flight like this, it's incredibly expensive and difficult to control them. And the key process is that, in actual fact, locusts don't even grow wings for many, many weeks. I think a couple of months. They don't even grow wings. So this is them hatching out in my lab in Oxford. They drying themselves in the heat lamps, and they'll begin to march. So they'll start from day one, if they're gregarious, to start to march together without wings. So it's entirely two-dimensional in the desert environment. Well, why is this important? I did my field research in Mauritania. I'll show you some pictures of that later. But this one species of locust, the desert locust, can invade up to one-fifth of the Earth's land surface during plague years. And with global warming, that region is expanding all the time. But these are poor countries that can't afford agrochemicals. And the FAO estimates that the desert locust damages the livelihood of one-tenth of the world's population. It's hard to think of something as dramatic as that where there's no research going on into this. I can think of maybe two or three labs in the world that study this. And we were really propelled into action by a review in Science magazine that wrote, even after 50 years of experience, fighting locusts is more of an art than a science. Now, a key feature of locust biology that you may not know is locusts can't stand being near each other. They're shy, green, cryptic grasshoppers. If you leave them alone, they avoid each other. They hate coming close to each other. It's only if you force them together or if the food becomes uh, you know, clumped, they're forced to come together, that they switch into what we call the gregarious or the swarming morph. Okay, so I'll come back to that at the moment. All of our experiments are done with a swarming type of locust. And Steve Simpson at the University of Sydney, he used to be at Oxford, has shown that it's local, visual, and olfaction combined, and also just bumping into others with your back leg that causes you to become gregarious. And it happens within an hour, behaviorally. So it's like two organisms within one genome. OK, so the first thing we wanted to ask, with the gregarious morph, why do we suddenly have swarms? Can we understand that? So we wanted to ask, what's the relationship between the density of insects and the swarm motion? And to do this, we developed this never-ending desert-like environment, or this sort of particle accelerator for, for locusts, <laughs> where these, these little creatures will just keep running around here for eight hours a day. And I developed software that would track their motion and their interactions so we could get really good data as to how they, they, they behaved. And we took all of this information and we condensed it down to a very simple value, which goes between 1, which is all the individuals going clockwise, and minus 1, which is they're all going anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. And you can see at low densities, this is a mess. They're behaving a bit like particles in a gas, bumping into each other, but there's no order to the system. But as we increase the density of locusts, suddenly they're going anti-clockwise and clockwise, and anti-clockwise and clockwise. And here they've gone clockwise for the entire eight hours, which is a normal marching time in the field. And what did this remind us of? It reminded us of magnets. If you think about how a magnet is magnetic, it's because the particles tend to align with each other. And if you heat a magnet up with thermal energy, they start to vibrate, and then it's hard for them to align with each other, and it begins to break down. Suddenly, at the Curie point, which I think 770 degrees centigrade, the magnet loses magnetism. And so, kind of, you know, you may not think that a theory of magnetics can relate to locusts, 
But one of the things we know about these types of magnetic systems is that many of the details don't matter when you're looking at collective dynamics. So we chose a very simple model of magnets. The one difference is that individuals move in these animal groups. And we could actually match, this is the theoretical predictions at low, intermediate, and high density, and this is what the real locusts did. And I won't go through the details of how we fitted these models, but there was only one parameter that we needed to fit. And each point here is eight hours worth of locust data. So a huge experiment. And this is the total time spent in the ordered, this directed motion, as a function of density. And this is the number of direction changes as a function of density, just as predicted by this model. So we have a very good understanding of the dynamics of this system, but virtually no understanding as to why they align with each other. So if you look at this, this science paper, we actually speculate, and we're quite wrong in our speculation, but that's the whole process of science. And uh, the, the real explanation for why they align actually came completely by accident. Um, so I was putting the, the locusts in in the mornings. Jerome Buell, the postdoc who was working in the group, didn't like the mornings very much. I'm not hugely fond of them myself, but we, we sort of had this division of labor where someone would put the locusts in and someone would take them out after eight hours. And he'd, he'd sort of just dress in black and come in and go, Ian, you didn't count the locusts correctly. And, you know, after a few days, I started getting really worried that I was either insane or that this guy was going to come stab me for ruining his incredibly elaborate experiment. And what we ended up realizing was these little blighters, if you look to the videos, were actually eating each other. These apparently vegetarian insects were coming and eating each other. Completely fortuitous. We weren't looking for that, but we found it. And I was very lucky to have an undergraduate student at the time. This is the kind of damage that they get. I was very lucky to have an undergraduate student, Sepide Bazazi, in the lab, and she performed these meticulous experiments where she could locate the nerve that gives the locust the sensation from its abdomen, so where it can feel the biting behavior from others. And she could snip it, so the locust could no longer feel that. Or she could locate it but not snip it, so it have control insects. And of course, you know, if we were to have our abdomen denervated, that might really annoy us. But these are robust little insects. They're really tough little creatures. And we find absolutely no difference in individual level behavior between the nerve cut individuals and individuals that could feel when they were on their own. They fed the same way, they moved the same way. But when they were in swarms, swarms of nerve cut individuals didn't swarm. We completely inhibited their swarm behavior by preventing them from feeling this biting behavior. And this happened very quickly in our experiments. So this is a normal swarm versus the nerve cut swarm. But we also were you know, intrigued by the visual system. This is a normal locus that's got a very big compound eye here. And so this is a pretty high-tech experiment where we painted the front half of the eye black with modeling paint. So the locus can't see information ahead. And here we paint the back half of the eye so it can't get information from behind. And here the poor locust is completely blind. And <laughs> poor little things. But the, you know, the, the, point, the point to note here is that the totally blind swarms, swarms of completely blind individuals, behaved indistinguishably from individuals that couldn't see individuals coming from behind. So if you can't see them approaching you from behind, you can't feel them biting you from behind, you don't march. And so it's not a cooperative act. When you look at these swarms, it might look that like they're all helping each other. It's very, very far from that. In actual fact, when density increases, it's aggressive interactions among the individuals that lead to the onset and maintenance of swarms. They really are on a forced march. Stop and you get eaten. And so I went out, I went out to Mauritania to try to test these ideas, and it was an experience. Um, we found the locusts, which actually is very difficult in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but, um, and here you can see the footprints in the sand, and this is our camel. This is Abdallah al Baba, who's a, a colleague in Mauritania. And um, this is just a camel. It's not often you do field work with a camel, so I took many pictures of it. But you know, it turns out that I'm not very good at planning these types of things. And so I didn't think, oh, there's a locust plague, therefore there's likely to be a famine. And so we ran out of food, and we couldn't, like, no matter how many euros and dollars we had, we couldn't buy anything except camel entrails, which we hung in a tree. And I'd been a vegetarian for a decade prior to this trip. You can see flies laying eggs over here. And um, we ate this, like, jerky, and I became horrifically sick. I mean, I really thought I was going to die. I was hallucinating and everything. And you can see how well prepared I was. This tent cost me 50 bucks. Um, 
But there, this, this here in the background is a sandstorm moving towards us. And it actually took their tent out. And mine was the one that stayed up. In the, in the, and you can see, you look, resourceful biologists. We also hung our clothes to dry in the same bush that we hung our jerky. It was a disaster. I was there for two and a half months. I got, I'm not exaggerating. I was there for two and a half months, and I got 20 minutes worth of video footage. And I've been too traumatized ever to look at it. And so this is actually the, the, say this is not a sandstorm. This is the same sandstorm from NASA's website. That's the, the west coast of Africa. So we came to the good old US of A, where there are roads and stuff like that, with some collaborators, Steve Simpson, Greg Sword, and Pat Lorch, to study a comparable system, which are Mormon crickets, which you may be familiar with. Here's one chowing down on one of his buddies. Um, and so these are highly aggressive uh, insects. And we'd find them frequently eating roadkills. These jackrabbits normally have ears approximately the length of their body. And you can see them crawling in through the eye and in through the mouth. So again, you know, these apparently vegetarian insects had a real taste for each other. Um, and so we performed these experiments where we used artificial diets P, C is P is protein, C is carbohydrate, C here is just carbohydrate, this is just protein, and this is completely neutral. Zero means like there's no nutritional value. Okay, and so you'd expect vegetarian insects to really go for carbohydrates. But you can see from the plot here that they love protein. And the next figure is my favorite, actually. I've got a sort of living histogram. Of course, we randomized this when we did the experiments. But here's water going increasing salt concentration up to 2 molar salt concentration. And they can see them fighting over 0.25 molar. They taste it with their feet, and they fight with each other over it. And they have a very strong preference for that particular concentration of salt, which, of course, turns out to be the concentration of their blood. They're highly tuned to this cannibalistic lifestyle. So we have a new mechanism of collective behavior that no one knew about before that we call a forced march, where individuals attack those ahead and try to prevent themselves from being attacked from behind, stop and you risk being cannibalized. And so we can make some predictions. If we sate them with protein and salt, we should inhibit cannibalism and inhibit swarms. And I won't go through the experiments with very, very high significance. We were able to do so. But the question I often get is, well, why can't you go out and just put protein down into these environments? Well, finding the insects is the challenge. If you can find them, you may as well use insecticide. But finding them is the real challenge. So understanding what drives it allows us to help find them. Um, and in case you sort of saw my sleight of hand move where I suddenly shifted from locusts to a completely unrelated organism, um, we have actually gone back to locusts in the laboratory and shown the same mechanism does hold for the locusts. And one of the cool things about this is we were also, you know, we got these ideas about ferrous magnetic systems, how magnets align. But we actually were able to go back to the physics community with our model that there's no explicit alignment. They just chase after those moving away and move away from those moving towards. And so we were able to add new understanding of types of ordered systems in, in physics, which was kind of fun. And the last slide is really something we, 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 it's in revision at the moment, where we think we can now understand, again, for the first time, we can now understand why there are two morphs of locusts. The current explanation uses group selection to explain this. We have an individual level selection argument here which was that if we allow in our models individuals to evolve strategies, they can evolve any strategies they want. They could evolve to align with each other. They can evolve to repel from each other, whatever they want. What we find is below a critical uh, density, individuals evolve to avoid everyone else. Above that critical density, however, individuals evolve to pursue those moving away from themselves and run away from those moving towards themselves. And the outcome is this sudden transition, this evolutionary stable strategy from being solitary to being gregarious. And what's kind of cool about this, so here we have the solitarious and the gregarious forms of these locusts explained. And what's kind of cool about this, and here we have no swarm and swarm behavior occurring, is that, oh, this is kind of a bit washed out, I'm sorry, but at low density, they just move away from each other. And that allows them to be these shy, cryptic green grasshoppers. But the evolutionary stable strategy above a critical density, even though it's to minimize cannibalism, is to be attracted towards others. So the density increases, even though the selection pressure is exactly the same, to avoid cannibalism. This minimizes your risk of cannibalism at high density. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. I'd love to take questions. <laughs>